we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. You're listening to Oh Brother, When Art Thou? And now here's your host, Neil White. Welcome to Oh Brother, When Art Thou? I'm your host, Neil White, joined as always by my brother, David. How are you, David? Doing pretty well, Neil. Yourself? The sun is shining. It is warm here. I hope it's the same wherever you are. It's nice to get some warm days as we come out of winter here in the Northern Hemisphere. Hopefully it just keeps getting better. But for now, let's do a history podcast. So David, oh brother, when art thou? Neil, it's February 21st, 1814, and there's excitement on the streets of London. Messages have arrived from Dover by semaphore. And now a coach carrying Colonel Dubourg, aide-de-camp to General Cathcart, is passing by. The uniformed man leaning out to shout the good news to passers-by. Napoleon is dead. The war is as good as won. All right, David, we are in England. And it's a French general leader, ruler, who is dead. Napoleon, quite famous. I'm sure most people have heard of him. So take us to February 21st, 1814. Why would they be so excited by the death of this French leader, Napoleon? Well, at this point, the wars against Napoleon specifically have dragged on for over a decade. And the wars against revolutionary France from the perspective of England have dragged on for over two decades. So... The prospect of the war being over, of peace, of a chance to rebuild economies that have been shattered by war, is certainly something that is attractive to anyone who hears it. You can understand why the people of London would be very excited to hear this somewhat improbable news. So it's good news for England, could be a chance for peace. Why is it improbable news, David? Well, the big reason it's improbable is because Napoleon is a excellent general who's outmaneuvered his foes before and the idea that he not only died but died in such a way that the war is almost over not just an accident or an illness but the sort of dramatic defeat that is creating the possibility for dramatic change in the war that's quite unlikely and in point of fact it's not even slightly true. As Mark Twain once said, rumors of his death have been greatly exaggerated. Indeed, they have. And, of course, that's a problem in the immediate aftermath of the excitement. Some people, including the famous economist David Ricardo, are now investigating precisely how this specific rumor got so conveniently exaggerated. So, David, fake news, as we would say now, that Napoleon is dead, and what needs to be investigated is how everyone came to believe that Napoleon is dead. Is that what's happening here? That's exactly what's happening here. So, David, you mentioned this news spread by flags, by semaphore symbols. You also mentioned it spread through a horse-drawn carriage. Is it merely a fact of the communication technologies at the time that are exaggerating these rumors and and spreading this quote-unquote fake news? No, but the communication technologies are vitally important. As the investigatory committee quickly realizes, this wasn't just a rumor. This was a stock fraud. Some people have made enormous amounts of money by using the time delay between their creating this first rumor that Napoleon was dead and then selling government stocks that they had secretly purchased beforehand in order to make a vast profit while everybody thought that great things for the English government were happening and then get out before everybody realized that no, this whole story was false. It's always good to follow the money. And in this case, the money is leading us to the stock market where there are some people getting rich off rumors of Napoleon's death. Is that case closed, David? Have we found the culprits? Well, it certainly is suggestive that this is where the story came from. But of course, if you are, say, Ricardo and his crack team of investigators, 
just knowing that this is a stock fraud isn't very helpful. What's important is determining who precisely was involved and punishing them for breaking the stock market. This is a fraud, it's criminal, and this team of investigators are out to capture the culprits. All right, David, but shouldn't it be pretty easy? You just look at who had stocks and who made good money off of this and then slap some handcuffs on them? Well, the trick is proving that they didn't just get lucky because the stock market, the stocks specifically for British government stocks went way up immediately after the rumor started spreading. A perfectly reasonable stock trader who had nothing to do with the actual planting of the rumors might have seen the stocks going up and sold them and made a profit and not been involved in the original crime. And indeed, many people did, since even at the time, the rumors seemed implausible. So the question is how to track down the people who initially spread these rumors. Okay, that makes sense, David. So we've got people getting rich on the stock market but we need to figure out who is the originator of all of this. So is there a way, David, to trace the rumors back, sort of a reverse game of telephone? So here's where they have one enormous advantage. They start by tracing the horse and carriage, the guy who we just discussed riding through London, shouting that Napoleon is dead. Who was he? And they quickly find out that reports are that it was Colonel Dubourg, the aide-de-camp to General Cathcart, a senior British military leader who would have a ton of credibility. But they also determined that Colonel Dubourg was in Dover the entire time, and definitely 100% was not the guy inside of the carriage. I suppose this is where it gets tricky, David, in an age before cell phone photography, when everyone's picture was being snapped everywhere, people wouldn't have necessarily known what Colonel Dubourg looked like and couldn't necessarily identify who this fake Dubourg was. Certainly for the initial period, yes. As he rode through the streets of London, just telling people he was Dubourg, everybody believed it because why wouldn't you? But as they're tracking back, they realize that at some point he had to pay for the horse and the carriage. He had to pay to enter an inn, a hotel. And if they can track the transactions, they can track the guy who paid them where the money came from. Again, follow the money. And they'll be able to find out who this fake Colonel Dubourg really was. Show me the money, David. So our fake Colonel Dubourg was really a man, a Prussian aristocrat living in exile in England after Napoleon conquered his country, effectively broke, by the name of Charles Random de Beranger. So he is our first suspect, but clearly he's only a bit player because he was basically broke, so he couldn't have bought the stock that the conspirators needed to buy in order to sell it after they'd boosted its price. All right, David. Now, if I've watched a lot of crime movies, and I have, at this point, you want to round this guy up beat him up a little bit, and get him to take you to his superior. Is that right? Well, beating him up is a little bit extreme. Actually, again, they focus on the records. Where was he in the days and weeks before February 21st? Who did he talk to? They're trying to figure out who's he connected to. And they pretty quickly find out that he's connected to Richard Butts, a well-known stockbroker, Again, not the actual money, not the top of the conspiracy, but now we're starting to find the key pieces, the guys who were involved in this. All right, David, if you were making a Hollywood movie of it, you'd want to rough them up a little bit, something a little more action, but real police work, follow the paper trail, follow the money, follow his connections, old-fashioned legwork. Now we're starting to get to the heart of this conspiracy is this one of those crime webs, David, that once you pull on that one string, the whole thing just quickly unravels? Or do the investigators start to run into roadblocks? Oh, it unravels very quickly. And in a very, very short period of time, the investigators have determined one guy who is definitely at the center of this whole thing 
a guy by the name of Andrew Cochran Johnston. He was originally just Andrew Cochran. He took the name Johnston when he married into the notable Johnston family. But as Andrew Cochran, he's also from one of the most notable families in Scotland himself. And he's got a somewhat sketchy history. He's exactly the type of person who you'd expect to be involved in a somewhat shady stock transaction. And he's recently been having financial troubles, so he's got the motivation. So it seems like they've got an obvious culprit. He seems really guilty, and everything's going great. We're lining up our prosecution for this crime. And if we just stop there, just stopped asking inconvenient questions, it seems like everything is going to go smoothly. Case closed, David, and we always like to end the podcast with a quiz. Can we get to that part now? So, unfortunately, we keep asking questions. The Once you let the crack investigators start investigating, they just keep doing it. And sometimes what they turn up is not what you were hoping. Because Andrew Cochran Johnston, as I've said, is a member of one of the most prominent families in Scotland. And as we're trying to figure out where he got all the money for this stock scam, one of his nephews becomes an obvious suspect for that element of this crime. Unfortunately, that nephew is Thomas Cochrane, one of the most famous Napoleonic War Navy captain war heroes of the era. And prosecuting him is going to be a lot more inconvenient for all concerned than going after his uncle. So, David, it would appear that this naval hero of the Napoleonic War is the money man for a fraud around the death of Napoleon. And that, David, might just be an inconvenient truth for the British authorities? Even more inconvenient. It's a truth that's inconvenient for some of the British authorities because Thomas Cochran isn't only a famous naval hero with a crazy popular background running daring raids on the French coast. He's also the darling of the British radical left wing. He's recently been elected into parliament as a member of parliament in the radical faction. And he's got big supporters, yes, in the British establishment, but also big opponents in the British Tory establishment who do not like this young radical Whig. Well, David, I've been saying for years that we need to get politicians out of the stock market. It would appear that this is the case for Thomas Cochrane, whether he was directly involved or just fronting the money to his uncle for this stock fraud. Is this all going to go to trial, David? Is this going to be the sort of thing that ends up before the courts? This is going to go to trial. It's going to actually be fast-tracked so that it goes to trial speedily because everyone involved wants to see justice done. And so they're going to big out not just any judge, but one of the most prominent judges in England at this time, the Right Honorable Justice Edward Law, who, as well as having a great name for a judge, by the way, Judge Law. That is a pretty good name for a judge. He was literally born for the job. Was also raised to the peerage, made Lord Ellenborough on the back of his reputation as a leading legal scholar and judicial mind. So, David, are people in England paying attention to this trial? You'd have to imagine with such a salacious story and a high-profile name attached to it that this is sucking up some oxygen in the British legal system and within the population. So this trial is becoming a media circus. The newspapers can't get enough of the details that are leaking out before the trial even begins. Not only is there the money angle, 
and the war hero angle and the ordinary politics angle. But Thomas Cochrane publicly accuses Lord Ellenborough of being biased against the Whig party and cites earlier cases where Lord Ellenborough has ruled against some radical Whigs who have been charged, usually with libel, and he brings up the case of Francis Burnett, one of his friends and fellow MPs, and he claims that this is not merely false, not merely that he's innocent, but that this entire trial is being cooked up for political reasons. Well, David, nowadays there'd be cries of a witch hunt, of the most unjust trial of all time. I can only imagine what politicians today would say. It sounds like it was not too dissimilar back then. All of these crazy details, this potentially biased judge. Take us to the courtroom, David. So the trial initially grinds on, and frankly, the early portions of it are pretty boring for the reporters who have to cover it. A large portion of it deals with De Beranger, our low-level guy who went through the streets of London, dressed up as Colonel Dubourg, spreading the fake news. Everybody knows he's guilty. The evidence is pretty overwhelming, but the trial needs to go through it all. And then on and on, the trial drags all these elaborate stock market claims relating to a variety of co-defendants who have been brought in because they made big money on the day. There's long technical arguments about what's required to find someone guilty in this kind of a case. And then finally, it comes to Thomas Cochran. And then the trial goes wide open because where the prosecution had great cases against de Beranger and Andrew Cochran Johnston, when it comes to Thomas Cochran, the evidence proving that he knew that a stock market fraud was going on is very thin. And Thomas argues that he just took his uncle's advice on stock investing, which is not illegal. And if his uncle was running a fraud, then that's terrible, but has no connection to him. And eventually, it all comes down to a pair of eyewitnesses who completely 100% disagree with each other on a specific important fact. What color of shirt was De Beranger wearing on the night of February the 20th, just before February 21st, when he met with Thomas Cochran and his uncle, which everyone agrees he did. But what color of shirt was he wearing? As many a dramatic court case does, David, this one comes down to the finest of details. What's at stake here, David? And what are these two witnesses claiming? So, everyone agrees that de Beranger met with Thomas Cochran and Andrew Cochran Johnston the day before he dramatically rode through London claiming that Napoleon was dead. That's not in dispute. Everyone admits that he was wearing a military uniform at the time he met them. Thomas and Andrew and de Beranger himself all claim that their conversation was innocent, that they just met to discuss de Beranger's clearly precarious financial position and whether Thomas could help him move to America, something that he claims he wanted to do, but which just wasn't possible, driving him into committing this crime. They claim that he was wearing a green military uniform of the Prussian army, which he is fully entitled to wear. And therefore, for Thomas, that he had no idea that de Beranger was in any way involved in any kind of crazy stock market scheme. But another eyewitness, the coachman who brought de Beranger to the house, says that he was already wearing a replica of Dubourg's uniform, which he had no right to be wearing, and which any military man, like Thomas Cochran, famous naval war hero, would immediately have realized that he must have been up to no good because he was wearing a fake uniform 
And the prosecution suggests that this proves that Thomas Cochran knew that something shady was going on with his uncle and these fake investments before the stock market fraud occurred. If the green uniform fits, you must acquit. So does this all come down to which witness Judge Law believes, whether he believes the coachman or he believes the three men allegedly involved in this scheme? I should note it's not just the three men involved. Thomas Cochran also procures a statement, but not witness testimony in person in the courtroom, just a written statement from one of his household servants, one of the valets who looks after the house, who says that he saw de Beranger in a green uniform. So we've got two potentially uninterested parties who just disagree on the facts. And credibility is everything at this point. Who do you believe? And Judge Law makes it very clear who he believes in his instructions to the jury. He makes it 100% clear that he believes that the red uniform was being worn and that Thomas Cochran was guilty. So Judge Law, potentially not an unbiased source, according to Thomas Cochran, who has accused him of being against the radical party, but he thinks that the conspirators are lying, that de Berager was wearing the fake uniform that he would wear the next day, claiming that Napoleon was dead. And that's his instructions to the jury. How long does it take the jury to deliberate here, David? The jury's deliberation is a fairly normal period. It's a couple of hours, nothing short, nothing shocking, nothing long. It's not spectacularly drawn out. And Thomas Cochran, along with his uncle and his the other co-defendants, is found guilty. And at this point, Thomas Cochran announces that he wants an appeal, as is his right. He wants to appeal this case and bring specifically more witness testimony from the servant who said that he saw a green coat in person rather than through writing, which is a reasonable thing to request. Unfortunately for Thomas, his efforts to get an appeal going are quickly undermined when his uncle and several of the other defendants flee to France in order to avoid uh, their own guilty verdicts. So the defendants who were clearly guilty, David, the ones who there's no doubt were involved, they've decided to get out of town. And that leaves Thomas sort of holding the bag here, unable to appeal. Is this it, David? Is this the end of the case and, and the end of Thomas Cochran's political career? Well, it's the end of the case. Of course, having found him guilty, he needs to be punished. The first punishment levied is a massive fine, unsurprising. And of course, it's a financial disaster for Thomas Cochran. They also order, Judge Law orders him to be placed in the pillory, which they still did in 1814. That never happens. The government is so afraid of what would happen if they put this war hero in the pillory on public display because so many of the men who fought beside him have already stated that they'll come out to defend him if this happens, that the government is afraid of a riot. So they order that this particular punishment not be carried out. So the pillory, David, is like a stockade where his like head and arms would be encased or, or trapped in a wood block and then people could come along and shout at him presumably yeah the idea was that you'd be put on public display with a sign saying what your crimes are so that the entire world could see and you'd be stuck in this block so you couldn't just walk away sort of public humiliation that seems a little out of date even for 1814 but that's not going to happen anyways it's not going to happen it actually leads parliament to reform the pillory, uh, which is removed as a punishment for most crimes very shortly after this, because they decide if we're not willing to do it for famous people for fear of riots, it's really unfair that, you know, you can get out of being punished just because you're really famous. So it doesn't work anymore. So they get rid of that. So that's one effect. 
You also mentioned his political career. So his political career clearly isn't quite dead because immediately after he's been found guilty, there's a by-election in his riding because, of course, he's expelled from parliament for being found guilty. He runs and wins and becomes an MP once again, uh, showing his popularity, at least in his own riding, has not been hurt by the guilty findings of the court. So this is one of those situations, David, where though he's thrown out of parliament, he's not barred from running again. So he's right back in. He's right back in, briefly. But of course, he's broke and also bitter that he's been found guilty. So Thomas Cochrane will actually go on to one of the wildest portions of his career. So he's already been a Napoleonic War naval hero. He's supposed to be an inspiration for later literary figures like Captain Horatio Hornblower. So he's got all kinds of crazy stories about the time he sank a, an entire French fleet with his own fleet of fire ships, or the time he seized a Spanish frigate that was three times larger than the sloop he was commanding himself. But we're about to get even crazier, because he leaves England to join in the revolution against Spain in South America, and the government of Chile decides... Yes, he can't speak Spanish. Yes, he's been on shore as a politician rather than at sea as a naval officer for several years by this point. Yes, he was found guilty of stock fraud. But he's still the best man to command the entire Chilean fleet. So that becomes his new job, and it's an enormous success. He wins several improbable victories against larger Spanish fleets. Chile is super happy with that. He gets involved in freeing Peru because Chile is supporting the revolution in Peru because, of course, it also was a Spanish colony. And that's also a success. So, David, whether he was good at being a stock fraud artist or whether he even was one, he's certainly good at being a naval commander as he's now winning victories on the other side of the world in South America. Indeed. Uh, I should just wrap up a little bit. He then goes on to command the Brazilian Navy in their revolt against Portugal. He's finally learned a little bit of Spanish by this point, but it's not useful because, of course, in Brazil they speak Portuguese, which he doesn't speak. Somewhat successful, less dramatic than his Chilean victories, but still a fairly solid string of victories in Brazil. The Greeks immediately decide they're rebelling against Turkey at this point in history. They need him. Clearly, in this point, he's won, what, three separate revolutions? He's clearly the guy to hire. So he becomes the head of the Greek navy. Doesn't speak Greek any more than he spoke Spanish or Portuguese. Less successful there, but the Greek revolution overall is successful. And finally, he comes back to England wins a pardon from Parliament, and rejoins the Navy and ends his career as a senior British admiral. Well, David, there aren't too many politicians who could be convicted of stock fraud and then go to win not one, not two, not three, but four revolutions across the world and come back to a military position in England. That is quite the string of post-conviction successes. Indeed, it's all wildly improbable, but it all really happened because Thomas Cochrane, whether he was naive about money or whether he was a cynical, grasping sort of person, and I should note that in 1806, so well before all of this happened, the Earl of St. Vincent, who was one of the most senior admirals in the British fleet and knew not only Thomas, but the other Cochrans involved in the Navy, and there were several of them. Alexander Cochrane, for example, commanded the burning of Washington during the War of 1812, which was also occurring around this time period. He was a generation older than Thomas and not really involved in this because he was busy. But anyway, the Earl of St. Vincent, referring to the entire family in 1806, said, The Cochrans are not to be trusted out of sight. 
They are all mad, romantic, money-getting, and not truth-telling. There is not a single exception in any part of the family. So he had a certain reputation, a whole wild reputation, long before this all occurred. But whether he was guilty or not, the one thing everyone agrees on is that he was a spectacularly good naval officer. Well, David, that is quite the quote for a family. Uh, They should put it on their coat of arms or something, I think. But what a story, David, of stock fraud, a fake death, fake news, and all the way through to naval victories in South America and Greece. It was a ride you wouldn't expect. When you're following the adventures of someone as crazy as Thomas Cochrane, you never know where you're going to end up next. And of course, Napoleon actually died in May 1821, so a good seven years after this fake death that kicked off this wild series of events. And the whole seven years later left a lot of time for Thomas Cochrane to actually pick up a crazy rumor, which was never true, that while he was leading his South American navies to victory, he was secretly plotting to break on to the island of St. Helena and rescue Napoleon and then install him as the leader of South America, presumably as some kind of revenge for being found guilty of stock fraud. Uh, Those rumors actually circulated for years before Napoleon died, although obviously they never really made much sense and certainly weren't true. Just one more interesting footnote on a very interesting story. Thanks for telling us, David. I always enjoy it, Neil. And if you enjoyed it, you can connect with us on social media at When Art Thou. Let us know you enjoyed it and go take a look back and listen to some of our other episodes There's quite a few involving navies, quite a few involving legal cases, and even some involving stock markets. So whatever aspect of this you liked, there's something out there for you in history and in our history podcast. David, we always like to wrap up with a quiz. And with International Women's Day being this past week, I thought that we should do something to celebrate International Women's Day. So we have a quiz about the first for women throughout history. Sounds good, Neil. I'll give you two firsts, and you try to tell me which one actually came first between these two first things. Did I say first enough? I I feel like maybe I should say it a few more times. Here's how it's going to work. For example, Edith Wharton was the first woman to win a Pulitzer Prize for literature, and Bertha von Suttner was the first woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Which of these prizes happened first i would expect that edith wharton won for literature first well surprisingly david it was actually bertha von suttner who won the nobel peace prize in 1905 long before edith wharton won for her book the age of innocence in 1921 of course we all know that amelia Earhart was the first woman to fly solo across the atlantic ocean but another famous first crossing was Gertrude Ederle the first woman to swim across the English Channel? Which crossing happened first? That's an interesting one, because clearly it would have been possible to swim the English Channel much earlier than it was possible to fly across the Atlantic Ocean, but the idea of wanting to, I think, came about quite late in history before there was any actual interest in swimming across the English Channel. So it might be slightly counterintuitive, but I'm going to guess that Amelia Earhart's famous flight came first. I tricked you up again, David. Gertrude Ederle actually swam across the English Channel in 1926. Earhart would fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean in 1932. Sarah Christian was the first woman to race in NASCAR, David, while Valentina Tereshkova was the first woman to fly in space. She's also the youngest woman ever to have flown in space. Which of those happened first, the first woman in NASCAR or the first woman in space? First in NASCAR or the first in space? I really don't know enough about NASCAR to have a good handle on when the first woman raced there which makes it hard to guess, I'll guess that the first woman to drive in NASCAR occurred before the first woman to fly in space. 
You're right, David. Christian took part in the first NASCAR race in 1949. Tereshkova flew in 1963. Another Russian cosmonaut, David, Svetlana Savistakaya, was the first woman to spacewalk, while Solvig Kray was the first woman commander of a submarine when she took command of a Norwegian sub. So which happened first, a woman spacewalking or a woman commanding a submarine in the ocean? Another hard one. I had never heard of Solvig Kray, but I unfortunately know that many militaries were very reluctant to allow women to serve, let alone to command in their navies. So I'm going to guess, again, counterintuitive as it may be, that the first woman in walking in space occurred before the first woman commanding under the ocean. You are bang on in that assessment, David. The first spacewalk by a woman was in 1984. Solveig Cray didn't take command of that Norwegian sub until 1995. Last question for you, David. Catherine Bigelow was the first and so far the only woman to win the Academy Award for Best Director. Did she win that before or after Mia Hamm was the first woman inducted into the World Football Hall of Fame? Of course, that's soccer here in North America. Oof, that's two that I really am not sure about. I'll guess that the first woman inducted into the World Football Hall of Fame occurred before the first woman winning an Oscar, but I'm really not confident either way. Well, David, you are right to be not confident. It was close, but Catherine Bigelow won at the awards show in 2010 for her movie The Hurt Locker. Mia Hamm was inducted in 2013. Thanks for playing along, David. I always enjoy it, Neil. And thanks for listening. 